In this module, we're going to begin our discussion of tools and equipment. We're going to talk about an introduction to tools and equipment and specific hand tools, including knives, whisks, spoons, and other items. The objectives for this section are list NSF safety standard requirements and explain safe and sanitary equipment design, select and care for knives, and identify a variety of professional kitchen tools and equipment. Known as the most trusted name in food safety, NSF International has been helping businesses in agriculture, processing, food equipment, restaurant, and retail industries to navigate the food safety and regulatory environment for more than 70 years. Their extensive suite of food safety and quality service spans every link from farm to fork, including certification, testing, training, consulting, auditing, and regulatory compliance. NSF offers the most accepted and trusted certification and registration programs for commercial food service equipment specified by health departments, restaurant buyers, and specifiers worldwide. NSF means market access. Products with the NSF mark received guaranteed regulatory acceptance in North America and improved acceptance worldwide. Registration programs such as HACCP compliant verification EU demonstrate in the EU demonstrate hygienic quality independently verified by a trusted source. They receive, test, certify, and register food equipment products for acceptance across the United States, Europe, and other global markets based on design standards, construction standards, and installation standards. Food contact surfaces, such as bowls and other equipment, have to be easy to clean. Tables have to be non-toxic, non-absorbent, non-reactive, corrosion-resistant, smooth and pit-free, no ledges, rounded edges for safety, sealed seams to prevent any bacteria growth, and no rivets or bolts. Any equipment with a coating material such as polycarbonate or enamel has to be non-toxic and easily cleaned and resist chipping and cracking. Before purchasing or releasing any piece of equipment, big or small, always ask yourself four questions. Is it necessary? Is this piece of equipment necessary to be able to perform the function of the restaurant or operation? Will it perform in the space available? Oftentimes restaurants and kitchens have limited space and that space is taken up by vital equipment. Always keep in mind that not only does the equipment have to fit in the space, if it's on casters, you have to make allotment for the base of that equipment as well. Is it the most economical for the operations and needs? Perhaps you don't need the $400 blender if you're only doing regular blended items, a simple bar blender will work. Is it easy to clean, maintain, and repair? If it follows the NSF international guidelines, this should be a yes on those occasions. I'm Will Griffin. I'm a knife maker. The knife is the most important tool that a chef uses. A chef knife is the most versatile knife in the kitchen. If you have to buy one knife, make it a chef's knife. First, let's talk about steel. This knife here is Japanese, made in a Western style. You can see it has a lot of similarities to the Wusthof here, which is German made. The big difference between these two is that this knife is made of a carbon steel, a high carbon steel, not a stainless steel. This knife will react with the environment. So it will patina and darken over time and potentially rust as well. The patina on this steel right here is from six or seven years of use in a professional kitchen. Whereas the stainless steel knife, it won't patina or rust over time in most normal circumstances. 
The reason you might choose a carbon steel knife, carbon steel is easier to resharpen and many people, myself included, prefer the aesthetics of a knife that adapts to its environment over time. The next thing to talk about is the hardness of the steel. You can control the hardness of the steel based on how you heat treat the steel as part of the knife making process. Here's a Japanese made knife with a very high level of hardness in the steel. The benefits of it are that it maintains its edge for longer, so you don't need to sharpen the edge as frequently. The downside of that is the edge is more brittle. I have an example of a very hard knife here that I dropped on my kitchen floor and the tip just broke right off. The Wusthof's a good example of a knife that's a little bit softer. There's pros and cons of that as well. So the softer knives, they won't retain an edge as long, but the edge won't chip as easily and the whole knife in general will be more resistant to shock and abuse. If you were to drop it on your kitchen floor, the tip would kind of bend over and you could probably bend it back straight. So the next thing to talk about is the blade shape. So this type of a profile or blade shape, it's very flat along the edge. It's really well designed for slicing and for cutting things on a cutting board this way. The German style profile with the very rounded belly is much more designed to cut this way on the cutting board. So to rock along that curved belly. If we're now just talking about European style blade shapes, you've got the German guy here and then here is this French chef knife. And you can see the difference in these profiles. So the French chef knife is a little bit more similar to the Japanese one in that it's pretty flat and tends to be a little bit more narrow. It's still rounded here, so it can still do that. But the fact that it's so straight on the back says to me that it's designed also for a lot of slicing and sort of push cutting techniques as well. Next, let's talk about blade thickness. Here's an example of a Japanese-made knife that's very thin. The thinner a knife is, the better it is for most cutting tasks. The only downside of a thin knife is that it can be more delicate when you start to talk about more robust foods. Anything where I might run into a bone or something, you know, this knife isn't the knife for that job. One element of the thinness is that it doesn't have a lot of weight behind it. That can be a pro or a con. It's nice to have something that's light if you're chopping all day, but also sometimes you feel like a little bit more weight can help you get through things. And then the other example is the Wusthof here. Much thicker in cross section. Thicker at the spine, but also thicker down at the edge as well. The thicker knife is just gonna do better in situations where there's more stress put on the blade. One isn't necessarily better than the other, but I will say in general, if you can cook in a delicate way, then you should choose the thinnest knife that works for you because the thinner the knife, the better it's gonna move through the food. Let's talk about double bevel versus single bevel knives. This is a Japanese made single bevel knife. The bevel refers to the part of the knife that's ground on a grinder down to the cutting edge. And you can see there's a line that's the transition between the bevel and the upper part of the knife. So this has a bevel on the right hand side, but it does not have a bevel on the back side. Essentially it's flat, although it's actually concave. There are a lot of benefits of knives like this. They cut extremely well. These knives are ideal for cutting raw fish. That's why sushi chefs use those sashimi knives. There's nothing like those in the world. But there are a number of downsides with these types of knives. The edges tend to be very, very delicate because of how thin they are. And it requires some learning and some experience to know how to sharpen these kind of knives because it's a completely different sharpening technique than your double bevel. Another tricky part of these single bevel knives is that when you cut, the cut tends to want to wander away from the bevel. The knife just wants to pull over to the left a little bit. You can adapt to it and sort of adjust your technique and you can do it, but a double bevel knife will cut straight down. There's a small bevel here and a small one here, and it's ground equally on both sides. The benefits of that, there's a little bit more meat right at the edge of the knife, so it's a little bit more robust. They're also easier to sharpen. 
Another feature of these single bevel knives is that there's a handedness to them. So this is a right-handed knife. The handle is shaped to accommodate a right-handed grip and the, the blade is actually a right-handed blade as well. So the bevel's on the right-hand side and the hollow is on the left-hand side. So it's designed for a right-handed person to cut this way. A left-handed knife would have the bevel on the left and the hollow over here and the person would cut this way. If you're left-handed, be careful before you buy one of these. So let's talk about blade length. 240 millimeter or let's say nine inches up to around 10 inches is a very common size for professional cooks. A larger knife can be good for processing a lot of ingredients quickly. You can line up more stuff on your cutting board and kind of get through it quicker. A larger knife has some downsides. They tend to be heavier because there's just more steel there. They can also just be overkill if you have a small space, if you use a small cutting board. I would say the most common size of chef knife out there is probably around an eight inch chef knife. So this is the eight inch Wusthof. Here's another eight inch knife, the Japanese made knife. That's a great all around size for most things and many people in restaurants use this size as well. But I also think there's something to be said for a knife that's smaller than eight inches. So here's the Wusthof six inch chef knife. And I think this is a great size for people who have limited space. You feel like you have more control over a knife this size, especially like out towards the tip of the knife. I feel like I have more pinpoint control over that area than when I'm holding a knife like this and the tip is just so far away from where I'm holding it. So if you're doing mincing shallots, doing finer work, a small knife is great. And this is also big enough to chop carrots, do whatever. So if you don't do hours upon hours of prep work at home, the savings that come along with a smaller knife might be something to think about. Moving on to handles, first we're gonna talk about the tang design. So here's a Japanese made chef knife. Features a hidden tang style construction in the handle. It means that the steel of the blade extends part of the way into the handle and then is usually glued in there. And then there's a handle material that's shaped on top of that. Here's an example of a hidden tang knife with no handle on it. So it gives you a good sense of what's going on inside the handle of a hidden tang knife. And then if you compare the hidden tang to the full tang knife, here's the Wusthof again. The steel extends all the way through the handle and then there's just two flat handle scales that are glued and riveted onto that steel. So there's a lot more mass and material back here in the handle and that tends to move the weight of the knife back towards the handle. One difference to maybe think about is the hidden tang knife design is a little bit less suited to very heavy applications, I would say. It's not meant to be really hammered into the cutting board. A full tang design is much more robust in that area. You could be a little rougher on the knife and not worry about the handle coming apart with the tang. For most cooking applications, I wouldn't say there's a big difference in quality or strength between these two types of handle designs. Knife makers use a lot of different materials for their handles. Again, it's a matter of preference. This particular knife, this is a, a Victorinox. Their handles are made of this Fibrox material, a very food service kind of oriented knife. It's easy to wash. It's certified to not harbor bacteria and things like that, which is important in sort of institutional kitchens. So the material needs to suit the environment that it's being used in. There's also the Wusthof. They use just a black plastic material. It's a man-made material that's basically indestructible, very easy to maintain. It doesn't warp or change in dimension. A great material for ease of maintenance, I would say. Here's a handle that's very similar in design to the Wusthof, but this is the vintage French chef knife. And this is when they were still using wood on their handles. So that requires a little bit more maintenance than the man-made material. A wood handle might be appropriate for somebody who appreciates the beauty of the natural material and the uniqueness of it as well. No two pieces of wood are exactly alike, so there's some element of nature finding its way into the knife, which I appreciate. There are a really wide variety of handle shapes out there. 
The most important thing when it comes to choosing the shape of the handle of your knife is putting it in your hand and seeing how it feels. One thing that's characteristic of these is this flared out end of the handle here. That tends to hold your hand in place. And then it's got a little swell here that kind of fits your palm. If you look at the Sabatier, the French version, you can see how there's similarities, but little differences. They both have the swell here at the end, but this one's just a little more narrow, a little straighter. You can even bring in a Western style chef knife, but made in Japan. They've adopted a similar handle profile, just with a little bit more angular, I would say, but it has that same swell there. So that, that's a common feature. And then you can go to something like this. This is a Chroma chef knife, and they've designed sort of an interesting thing here where the handle and this blade is one integral piece of steel. A knife like this, I would certainly want to hold on to before I bought one, just to make sure that that feels comfortable to me. In cooking, there's two main ways you hold a chef knife. You hold it this way for doing heavy duty chopping, and then you hold it this way with your fingers up pinching the blade, and that's for more fine work. So this leads us into a discussion about the balance of a chef knife. I would say balance is very much a matter of personal preference. And when we talk about balance, generally we mean where does the knife balance from this end to this end? If a knife is more blade heavy, it tends to balance out here. If a knife is more handle heavy, it tends to balance somewhere along the handle. This knife is very blade heavy. Some people prefer a more handle heavy knife. Some people prefer a more blade heavy knife. A knife that balances in the front of your hand, where that first finger kind of is, tends to be a knife that feels balanced. If the balance point were to be way out here and I'm holding the knife here, that's gonna be a knife that feels very top heavy. If the balance is way back here, it's gonna feel like it takes a lot of extra work to get it to go this way. So in general, you wanna look for a balance close to where you're holding it with this first finger. And both of these knives are close to that. This one happens to be a little bit in front of it. This one happens to be a little bit behind where that first finger is. But they're still generally balanced in that way. Another part of the handle to consider is the bolster. If you look at this Wusthof, you can see that this knife has a bolster. The bolster is this steel that's around the heel of the blade that sort of transitions into the handle here. If you take a look at one of the knives I made, there's no bolster here. So it's just the blade steel. That's the difference. Now, it's sort of a safety feature, the bolster. It prevents your finger from slipping up here and getting nicked on the very heel of the blade. That seems to be the main function of what the bolster is there to do, but that also comes with a very serious drawback. It becomes very, very difficult to sharpen this blade all the way down to the very corner. No bolster, you can get your fingers closer into where the blade is, whereas this knife, there's no sharp edge in the corner, so I can't use that for anything. Whereas this knife, I can use this sharp corner to do things. Those are the main differences. So as we've seen, there's a lot of variety in the materials and design and construction of chef knives. So when it comes to picking one, it's important to find a knife that you connect with because you're going to be the one using it. And the more you like using it, the more you're going to be in the kitchen and the more fun you're going to have. Let's take a look at the anatomy of a chef knife. First part is the tip. This is the working end of the chef's knife and is probably one of the most fragile parts on the knife. Whenever the knife is dropped, this is usually the point that's going to break first. The cutting edge is the literal bleeding edge of the knife. The spine of the knife is the back. The bolster is the point where the handle meets the knife itself. This is a heavy part that's used for counterbalance in many cases. The heel of the knife is underneath the bolster, and this is where your fingers rest along the inside of the knife blade. The tang is the extended piece of metal that goes into the handle, and this is used for strength, rigidity, and counterbalance. And then the handle with the rivets, the rivets have to be smooth and flush so you don't have any irritation on the skin. Boning knives and fillet knives come in two different styles. The boning knife is a rigid knife and is used for boning things like chicken and beef, for getting around heavy bones and cutting through sinews whenever fabricating. A fillet or fillet knife 
is used for filleting fish. One of the more essential knives in the kitchen is the paring knife. The paring knife is a smaller version of a chef's knife that can be used either on small cutting, small chopping, or used when you choke up on it to get more intricate and detailed cuts. The cleaver is often used in conjunction with a boning knife. Whereas the boning knife is designed to get up next to the bones, the cleaver is designed to cut through the bones. Slicers come in various different styles and lengths. As you can see here, we've got a serrated slicer, which is used for cutting through breads, a long slicer, which is used for cutting meats and uh, roasts and things along those lines, and then a slicer that's similar to that, but which has a scalloped edge or a gratined edge, which prevents any starches or anything from sticking to the blade while you're cutting through it. A butcher's knife, known as a scimitar, is a long bladed knife that has a kerf to it. This is designed for cutting steaks and meats and chops. Oyster and clam knives are specialty knives used for being able to shuck oysters or getting inside of a clam shell. The majority of knives we've looked at so far, including our traditional chef's knife, has been a French style or German style knife. Japanese style knives are unique in the fact that many of them are only edged on one side as opposed to a two-sided blade on the French or German style. This means that instead of having a 13 to 30 degree angle of a uh, point or edge on the knife on the cutting surface, Japanese knives typically only are ground on one side and flat on the other side of the cutting edge, which gives them a very, very thin blade uh, and a small angle about seven degrees, which allows for extremely sharp cutting. This is by no means inclusive of knives. There are many, many, many more varieties of knives out there. And if you're interested, I would encourage you to visit en.wikipedia.org slash wiki slash kitchen underscore knife for more information. Sharpening stones are used to sharpen a knife once the edge is no longer viable. As you can see here, there are several different styles and several different grits from a Japanese stone on the left, which has a multiple grit, 400 uh, grit and 1,500 grit. Obviously the 400 is a heavier duty or grit used for cutting metal and the 1500 is used for polishing the metal at the end. You can also see on the right various different wet stones. This is W-H-E-T stones uh, used to grind and grate down an edge. Uh, from the lower end, the really coarse grain on the bottom to a more fine grain as you go up. Despite its reputation as a sharpening implement, a honing steel is actually designed to realign the barbs, the microscopic little shavings of metal on the edge of the blade that keeps the blade sharp. This is not intended to resharpen a knife once it gets to the point of being dull. With the exception of the one in the center, which is a diamond steel, which will actually cut metal and help in aiding resharpening. It's far harder working in the kitchen with a blunt knife than it is with a sharp knife. The secret behind keeping a sharp knife, sharpen it before and every time you use it. First, grip the steel. Feel really comfortable about holding the steel. Imagine you're holding a tennis racket or you're playing squash. You've got to be really comfortable with it. Now, 45 degrees, confident grip, confident grip with the knife. This is the butt of the steel. Really important you keep your fingers behind that. You never grip a steel with your fingers over that because the knife comes back in, you've just lost a finger. Always grip behind. Nice long strokes so we get the whole of the blade over steel. Stroke. And we start from the bottom to the top. So there, across. There, across. Slow strokes over the top of the steel. And then come back underneath. Then back underneath. It is so dangerous working in the kitchen with a blunt knife. You can cause so much damage. Working with a sharp knife is ten times quicker, more efficient. Now, that's ready to start chopping.
Now, the first thing that you're gonna need is a whetstone. If you don't have one already, please get this one. It's a double-sided King 1000, 6000 whetstone. You can see that there's two sides. This is the fine side, which is the 6000, and then this is the coarse side, which is the 1000. So one is for sharpening, and then the other is for polishing. It's the perfect combo. It also even comes with its own base, which is pretty awesome. Just so you guys know, I'm not sponsored by them. They don't know that I'm doing this. I just really love this stone. It is hands down the very best budget whetstone that you can buy. It's only $25 on Amazon, and if you got Prime, it's free shipping. So, I mean, come on. I put a link below. Go grab it. Now, when you're ready to sharpen, take your stone and submerge it in water and let it soak for five to 10 minutes. That may be slightly unnecessary for this kind of stone, but I personally like to do it. Now, obviously, you're gonna need some sort of knife to sharpen, so whichever that is, you can literally use any knife. There's no special knife you have to have. I obviously appear to be a knife hoarder, which is a little bit true, but you don't have to be in order to sharpen a knife, so. The only thing that I would mention is that whatever steel type you have will determine how long it takes for you to sharpen. Now, this white number two steel knife here sharpens very quickly, but if you have a German steel knife, which is a very common steel for most house knives, then it will take you a little longer, say 10, 15 minutes. Now, I'm gonna explain how to sharpen this in a very simplistic way. This can either be really confusing or just really straightforward, so I'm gonna keep it straightforward. Now, you're gonna take your soak stone and we're gonna start sharpening on the coarse side, which which would be the 1000 side. You're more than welcome to use a different stone, but I would try to keep the coarseness similar to the one that I'm using right now. Now listen carefully, there are two main factors that determine the sharpening of your knife, okay? And that is which hand is doing what. Now the hand that's holding the handle is gonna determine what angle the knife is gonna be sharpening at. Where is the angle of your edge going to be? I'm not gonna confuse you with which degree it needs to be, I'm just gonna use simple terminologies. And then the remaining hand that's not holding the handle is going to apply pressure to the blade so you can actually sharpen it. Now remember, when you're applying pressure, you're not applying pressure in the forward stroke, you're actually applying pressure when you're dragging the knife back towards you. Now, as for what angle you should use, the, the method that I personally like to use, instead of determining, oh, it's gonna be 45, 50, 70, whatever, it's never that accurate. So at the end of the day, just pretend that there's two or three quarters on the spine of your knife that's holding your knife up, and use that as a guide for your angle, as if there were, for some reason, two coins underneath the back of your knife. Now this is gonna take some practice, so don't expect to get it absolutely perfect the first time. Now, before you sharpen, make sure that you wet the top of the stone to make sure that the stone stays wet the entirety of your sharpening. If it starts to dry out, just reapply water to the top. Now, set up your sharpening. So, get that two or three coin angle, depending on whatever feels most comfortable to you, and then apply pressure in the area where you're ready to sharpen. I would recommend that you start doing the knife in segments. So let's start with the very back of the knife. Now, while first applying very little pressure, begin the movement by pushing the knife forward, and then while applying pressure, pull back. So you're gonna push forward again, and then apply pressure with your fingers and pull back. You're not applying pressure with the hand that's holding the handle. Remember, you're only applying pressure with the fingers that are on the blade. The hand that's on the handle only determines the angle and moves the knife back and forth. And you're gonna repeat that back and forth movement process 15 total times, or more depending on how much your knife needs to be sharpened. Now you're gonna do the exact same thing on the other side with the exact same angle. And do it for the same amount of strokes as you did as the first one. And you're gonna continue this process until that segment of the blade feels relatively sharp, and then repeat that process along the entirety of the blade. You're only gonna be doing it in segments piece by piece. It'll probably be anywhere from three to four segments of the knife. Now, once you reach the segment of the knife where it starts to curve a little bit, do not use the same exact method. It's gonna be similar, but going back and forth is just not gonna work. Instead, you're gonna be turning your knife just a little bit while you're doing that movement through the edge of the blade. So it's essentially the same thing, but instead of pulling it straight back and forth, you're just giving it a little bit of a turn at the same time, as you can see what I'm doing here. So it's not exactly back and forth, it's more of like a sliding back and forth. And guys, I really can't emphasize enough, but the most important thing here is trying to maintain the same angle all the way through the knife. That is going to take some practice, but I promise you, that is what is going to make your knife super duper sharp. Now, once you've completed sharpening the entire length of your knife on obviously both sides to make a bevel, you're going to use the fine polishing side of your stone now. We're just going to polish the edge up, and this is going to take it from sharp to razor sharp and just do the exact same thing that you did before, maintaining that same angle as you started with. Make sure that you wet the stone first and then run along all of the same spots that you ran over before, but this time with the polishing stone. And just to reiterate, make sure that you're getting the entire length of the blade, the entire length of the edge 
on both sides with the same angle. And that's pretty much it. You should have a relatively sharp knife by now. Now it's gonna get better over time as you practice, but you can literally see the edge of my knife in this video. This is the dull knife, and this is the freshly sharpened knife. You might see a little bit of a difference here. I don't know, you know, maybe it's just me, but I, I feel like there's a, I don't know. I feel like there's a little bit of a difference. That's just my personal opinion. So instead of using a honing rod, like most people think you should be using, please use a whetstone. And that is pretty much it. It's very simple. Don't overcomplicate it. It's really just a matter of making angles on two different sides. The more simplistic you view it, the easier it's going to be to do it. There are a lot of various hand tools. Hand tools can be used for multiple different things. Our, our knife arguably is a hand tool, but also things such as spatulas or turners as we call them. Microplanes, these are used for grating and grinding things like nutmeg and zesting lemons. Vegetable peelers. Meat forks for holding meat steady while you're slicing it. Meat mallets for pounding pieces of meat flat. Offset spatulas are used for cake icing and for getting into things where you don't want your knuckles to touch the table. Box graters for grating cheese and various other things. A box grater typically has multiple sides to accommodate for various different styles of grates. A piano whisk, so named because the wires resemble piano strings, is what most likely comes to mind when most people picture a whisk, and by far is the most common. Piano whips are also come sometimes called balloon whips or whisks because their shape is resembling of a hot air balloon. If you could have just one type of whisk at your disposal, the piano whip would also probably be the best choice. It's a good all around tool for blending, whipping, and beating all types of thin to medium textured products. It could be used to whip cream and beat egg whites or blend many types of batter. The balloon whip's round shape allows for users to get good food coverage around the bowls and cooking vessels. The drawback to the piano whisk is that dry ingredients and denser mixers can lump up behind the and inside the wires, making it a poor choice for blending thick batters and doughs. The French whip is the second most common type of whisk. It looks similar to the balloon whisk, but it is a little narrower and longer. In France, this tool is called a foyer à sauce, or a sauce whip. That name sheds light into its most common application, blending sauces. It's more elongated shape and makes the French whisk suitable for use in straight-sided pans and deeper vessels that balloon whips can't always reach into. A French whip closely resembles wires uh, that uh, are unsuitable for blending denser ingredients. Kettle whips are built with longer handles than the tools we've discussed so far. Their more compact heads are often round, but sometimes resemble that of a balloon whisk. Many round kettle whip heads are made from a single coiled wired shape like a beehive. Others are built with heads that look like wire cages. The kettle whip is designed to reach deep into kettles and stock pots to effectively blend ingredients into smooth soups and sauces. Smaller kettle whips are sometimes called twirl whisks. A flat whisk or roux whisk is designed to blend pan sauces and similar concoctions in shallow vessels. Its nearly flat shape resembles a flattened balloon whisk and is optimized to cover the wide surface of a pan bottom. The flat whisk's long concentric loops blend flour and other sauce ingredients to a smooth texture. Another tool for blending sauce, pan sauces is the spiral whisk, which features a slightly angled head wrapped in a coil of wire. This coil makes the whisk an effective choice for beating up clumps of flour and other dry ingredients in a thicker sauce and gravies. The dough whisk, sometimes called a Danish dough whisk, has one of the most unique shapes out of all the tools in this category. It's made with two concentric loops of wire. The outer one is nearly perfectly round and the inner one is formed into an oval shape with a small twist. This unique design is intended to 
enable cooks to blend doughs and denser batters into a uniform texture without beating them to the point of toughness or thickening cream. There are many different kinds of spatulas that can be used in a kitchen. Wooden spoons, metal spoons, and heat resistant spatulas are all various different types. As you can see from the wooden spoons, they come in various different sizes and shapes for different utilizations. From the far left side, which is more of a salad style for tossing salads, a slotted spoon, a solid spoon, a pasta spoon or a sauce spoon in the middle with a hole. Uh, that hole is typically used to uh, measure pasta or for uh, making sure that nothing sticks to the inside. It also has an edge to where it can use as a scraper for getting sauces around the edge of a pan and various different other ones. Wooden spoons are unique in the fact that they will not mar or damage the surface of a lot of pots, particularly those that are uh, Teflon coated. Metal spoons are the traditional spoons that you'll see in many, many kitchens. They come slotted, they come uh, whole, or they come with perforations in them. Various different uh, techniques use them for different reasons. And the heated resistant spatula or the heat resistant spatula, often referred to as the red handled spatula, although they do come in different colors, is essential for dealing with products that do not want to damage your pans in particular. Uh, you want to use those whenever you're making omelets or eggs, anything that has to do with Teflon coating. The workhorse of the kitchen is the tongs. The standard tong are the spring-loaded tongs, which are used for pretty much everything in the kitchen. They can be used to move ingredients around on the grill. They can be used to help hold a pan while it's in transit. Uh, the uh, spring-loaded tongs come in various different sizes, from 9 inches all the way up to 18 inches. Along with that, you have the coated handle tongs. These are used for applications where hot environments are a factor and you want something to be able to protect your hand. Color coating them also allows you to be able to sort them based on their utilization. Maybe you have a special kit that's designed for allergens. Typically allergens are resembled by the color purple. Not everything that's done in the kitchen is done by using a chef's knife. Sometimes we cut using other implements as well to be able to speed up the process. Tomato slicers spiral slicers, french fry cutters, and lettuce cutters are just a few of the various different kinds of cutting implements and dicing implements that we can use. This is a brief introduction into the equipment used for weights and measures. This topic will be discussed in greater detail in further lessons. Spring scale is used for measuring dry ingredients that are lightweight. The problem with the spring scale over time is that the metal will fatigue in the spring and it will become less accurate. Digital scales today are the preferred method of different scales to be able to use. They're very accurate and in many cases they're easily disposed of and replaced. The balance scale is a traditional scale used in bake shops where the flour or large quantity of ingredients can be measured readily easily. And then the receiving scale is useful whenever you're receiving product, particularly heavy boxes that have to be weighed to maintain or make sure that they are accurate for your ordering purposes. There's various volume measuring devices as well, beginning with measuring cups, which are usually either clear glass, Lexan, or plastic, measuring spoons, ladles, and something called a spoodle, which is a combination between a spoon and a ladle. Portion scoops, also known as dishers, come in various different sizes and various different colors. The colors actually indicate the size of the disher. This is a tool used for being able to dish up soft items such as mashed potatoes and have it put on the plate in a portion controlled manner. These are not ice cream scoops despite their common usage as such. These are ice cream scoops. The problem with using the disher as an ice cream scoop is that the release mechanism is not designed to handle anything that will stick in the bowl. 
Uh, ice cream is notorious for being cold and hard and sticking in the bowl, and it will break the mechanism. Uh, many times happens uh, more than not. Uh, that's why the ice cream scoop on the right actually has a paddle that releases from the bottom, pushing it out as opposed to scooping the edge of the bowl. As noted before, coloring codes allow us to be able to easily identify the scoop and its quantity. Along with that, it's also given a number. So for instance, a number four scoop is orange handle and it contains one scoop per cup. The number four also refers to the number of scoops it takes to make a quart container. So it takes four scoops to make a quart. There's one cup or four cups in every quart. So you can see that one scoop, uh, the number four scoop has one cup, takes four of those to make a quart. Same thing with the gray scoop, the number eight scoop. It takes eight scoops to make a quart. Each one of the eight scoop, each one of the scoops is one half of a cup. Portion control bags are designed to be able to portion out products such as vegetables or pastas or anything along those lines and also have them readily available for the usage in the kitchen. You can also buy these plain or with day dots attached to them. Day dots will allow you to be able to see at a quick glance because of their color coding when that product was made and bagged up. Let's summarize and discuss some takeaways for today. Takeaway number one. NSF provides standards for equipment, tools, and surfaces in the kitchen to promote safety and sanitation. Takeaway number two, knives are unique to the user and the task being completed. Takeaway number three, honing and sharpening a knife is not the same. Honing is done more often to keep a knife sharp, whereas sharpening is only done when the knife becomes dull and will no longer cut despite honing. Takeaway number four, piano whips and French whisks are the most common whisk. However, there are several job specific whisks available. Takeaway number five, portion scoops or dishers are not ice cream scoops. Takeaway number six, portion scoops are color coded and numbered in a way to easily identify them. This presentation will attempt to give an overview of the different small wares and pieces of equipment that you'll experience in a restaurant environment. However, it's not an exhaustive list. For more information, I suggest ktom.com, which can be accessed at the link on the screen.